Good morning, everyone, and welcome everyone to our August uh, Board of Regents meeting, uh, which begins with our committee meetings. Uh, I want to also acknowledge our system reps that are with us. We got upgraded to Collis Temple Junior from Collis Temple the Third today. Uh, it would not be a Regents meeting without a temple on the dais. Uh, and John Noble from UL, Dr. Leon Tarver, and Stevie Smith. Thank you all for joining us and representing your systems. We appreciate the partnership. Uh, members, remember that we are uh, being streamed live, so you'll need to turn your microphones on when you are recognized and speak directly into those microphones so that our virtual audience uh, can hear you. And I'll ask uh, Regent May to please call the Facilities and Property Committee to order. Yes, sir. Chair May. Here. Vice Chair Weil. Here. Regent Aubrey. Regent Levy, Here. Regent Meir, Regent Seal, Regent Temple, Supervisor Smith, Here. Supervisor Tarver, Here. Um, Supervisor Noble, Here. and Supervisor Temple. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now move to item number three, the consent agenda. Yes, sir. The, the consent agenda this month contains 10 small capital projects approved since our last facilities committee meeting. i um, be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, we recommend approval of the consent agenda. Very good. You heard the recommendations. Do we have any questions, comments? Is there a motion to approve? So motion by Commissioner Levy. Second. Commissioner Aubrey, thank you. Any discussions, any further questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Next up is item four, the IEB scope change request for UL Lafayette Learning Laboratory School. Yes, sir. Please, please proceed. The, um, for the members, the, the Interim Emergency Board is a constitutionally created entity that operates between legislative sessions to respond to emergency funding requests, uh, but another role they play is to um, modify or adjust priority funding or on capital outlay projects as well as change the scope of projects. Um, the capital outlay projects are uh, prescriptive and restricted to the, the, the forms that are submitted annually in terms of the scope of work. And in this instance, we had a request from the UL system on behalf of ULL to change the scope of work on an existing project, which is creating a new uh, laboratory school there on campus. The, uh, the site sits at the uh, location of the formal federal, federal estuary Estuarine Habitats Coastal Fisheries Center. Um, the original plan was to uh, re re renovate th that facility and um, they were going to put um, the lower level students in that facility and build a new high school for upper level students behind it. After some initial design work was done, it was determined that because of the layout of the existing facilities and the laboratory spaces that were already there, it would be better to put the upper level students within the existing building and build the, the lower level um, elementary and middle school facilities behind it. So that's what this request does. Um, it's simply to change the scope of work to, to swap out who, what the renovated facility and new construction sites will serve. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Levy. Second? Second. Second by... Okay, great. Any dis discussions or questions? Very good. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Any of those opposed? Seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Motion passes. Thank you. Next up is item five, Act 959 project submitted by LCTCS on behalf of Delgado Community Co College. Chris? Yes, sir. Um, 
As you know, the Act 959 allows institutions to pursue capital projects up to $10 million so long as the funding source does not come from state dollars. In this instance, Delgado received a hazard mitigation grant from FEMA to replace the roofing systems on five facilities across three uh, campus locations. It also comes with uh, window replacements and door replacements. Uh, to, to upgrade to more energy efficient and code compliant items at these sites. The, the three sites uh, are the City Park campus, two buildings on the West Bank campus, and two on the West Je Jefferson campus. The total project cost is about eight and a half million. That includes a 10% cost share as required by FEMA that Delgado is contributing. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions on this. Otherwise, we recommend approval as well. Thank you, Chris. Motion to approve. So move. Motion by Commissioner Aubrey. Second by. Second. And any discussions or questions, comments? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Very good. Motion passes. Now on to other business. Chris, we are excited to hear about the new deferred maintenance funds that have been made available. You have a Act 751 update for us? Yes, sir, I do. Um, when we last met in June, um, you know, the JLCB was, uh, we were preparing to meet in August 9th for the JLCB meeting. Since that time, um, uh, the projects, the, the global project list was approved on August 9th. The CEAs between facility planning and control in each system have been executed. We have received the project list that will be done with for this year. Um, they, you know, from the global list, it was condensed down to uh, fit within the budgetary parameters provided to each system uh, for this fiscal year. So we have those lists in hand. Um, and we should be starting um, work on those soon, or, or the institutions will be starting work on, on those soon. They're managing the projects, and um, you know, hopefully by our next update, uh, we'll have projects underway. Very good. Is there any other business to come before the committee? How, mu how much? <laughs> Very good. Any other comments? Yeah, as it relates to um, the funding for this year, how much is it for this year? Seventy-five million. And then, how much are we expecting next year? Um, it's uncertain at this point. Uh, it will be up to the legislature. So they will have to appropriate it each year. They will. They will. Okay. All right. Any other business to come before the committee? I would like. To just mention one final thing um, i have set up capital outlay site visits that will be forthcoming starting next week uh, i have uh, good legislative participation on the visit so i'll send everyone a calendar to the day of the upcoming visits and um, let you get know legislatively who will be in attendance and i encourage you all to attend if you're able to do so very good thank you chris is there a motion to adjourn Motion by Mr. Levy, second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? We are adjourned. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Regent May. Next up is the Academic and Student Affairs Committee, and I'd like to ask Regent Creed to please call this committee to order. Thank you. Uh, Regent Sterling. Regent Creed. Here. Uh, Regent Albury. Here. He's here. Regent Finley. Here. Regent Trier. Here. Regent Williams Brown. Here. Regent Orr. Here. LCTCS representative. Here. LSU representative. Here. Southern representative. Here. And UL system representative. Here. 
You have a quorum, sir. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, we'll now move to item number three, a consent agenda. Dr. Thank Denley, you. Uh, please proceed. <clears throat> yeah, so t today we have a, a very straightforward consent agenda, just four items. Uh, one, program termination, which is going to incorporate a program within uh, an existing program on that campus. And then three other name changes. So uh, senior staff recommend the adoption of the uh, items on the consent agenda. All right, you've heard the recommendation. Um, is there a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda? Second. All right, motion by Regent Fenley. Second? Second. Seconded by uh, Ms. Uh, Regent Williams-Brown. A motion, oh, excuse me. Um, any discussion or any questions? All those in favor signify by saying nay. All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Uh, moving to uh, on to academic programs, Dr. Denley, uh, please proceed. There we go. Yeah, so thank you so much. So we have two uh, degree programs uh, for your consideration today. Uh, so the, the, the first is uh, a BAS degree in organizational leadership that is at the University of Louisiana Monroe. Uh, we're happy to be uh, joined by Provost Arant, who uh, is in the, in the audience today, in case there are any questions from the institution's perspective. So uh, 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 this program is, uh, is, is, will be a terrific addition to our uh, a statewide portfolio. I think you, you know that we are really looking for ways to enable students to be able to, to have a sort of a, a pipeline of possibilities for their education. And so uh, up until relatively recently in our state, if a student earned an AAS degree, well then effectively that AAS degree was sort of the end of the road, that there really wasn't another degree that they could go get after that AAS degree without just basically starting all over again. Uh, that, uh, that changed when uh, there at uh, LSU A, Alexandria, uh, LSU Alexandria, created a BAAS degree, which allowed all of those uh, credits from their AAS degree to transfer in. That, that creates, if you will, uh, 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 very much a sort of a generalist degree for someone who has an AAS. This proposed program at uh, uh, UL Monroe uh, is in organizational leadership. So this is exactly a degree where if someone has an AAS degree, let's say in, uh, in HVAC or in uh, electrician or something like that, then this gives them the training to then be uh, in a managerial position, to, to, to be the, the plant manager or to, 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 to run the business of the HVAC. So it's a really terrific program, allows the students to take all of those 60 hours from their AAS and completely transfer them into uh, that, that, that BAS degree. It's available uh, both online, face-to-face, -face, and in a hybrid format, so really uh, a terrific addition. Uh, the, 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 the institution there has worked with all of the local community colleges, so Delta and, uh, and Bipsi, uh, Bossier Parish, have both been involved in the development of this program. And they've also actually worked with some of the other regional community colleges in neighborhood states, so in, in Mississippi and in Arkansas as well, to have those as feeders. So this is, uh, I think, a, a, terrific, uh, a terrific addition. Uh, next program is the BBA in Risk Management and Insurance at uh, Southern University A&M. Uh, so this, again, I think is a, a terrific addition for us. It actually already exists uh, as a concentration in a Southern's BS in Finance degree. So they already have uh, upwards of 100 students who are already in that concentration as part of their bachelor's program in finance. Uh, but uh, quite rightly, the institution would like to spin this, this degree out as its standalone uh, degree program, that, that way the, the students can have their expertise in risk and insurance recognized as part of the, of the description of their degree. And they have developed this program in collaboration with Alliant Insurance Foundation and Spencer Educational Foundation and the Louisiana Department of Insurance. And the, the two organizations have actually provided $2 million of support to, to actually further and to create this program. So again, uh, a really terrific uh, addition to us, but uh, building on an existing program that they have. And as, you know, the students have already voted with their feet. There's more than 100 students who are already in that concentration and now would be able to move over into that, uh, that standalone degree. So with that, happy to answer any questions, but recommend the approval of 
those academic programs as presented. All right, thank you. You've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to approve the academic programs? So moved. Who was that? Okay, uh, by Mr. Tarver. Uh, is there a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Regent Williams Brown. Any discussions? Any questions? I have a question. Dr. Dillon, it, it, with regard, if, if the provost from ULM is here, I would like to hear the feedback on this. Uh, they already offer a bachelor's degree in general studies. Do. I do know many institutions have general studies degree whereby they would have concentrations. And I'm curious as to why would a, a new uh, full four-year program, and I appreciate it's, it's no new faculty involved, but why wouldn't enhance, like some institutions have general studies, and maybe a concentration, maybe in applied science or organization theory. What's the thought process? Thought process behind that was the availability and transfer of gen ed courses. Mm -hmm. Typically, an AAS does not take the full menu of transfer or general education courses. So, in order to get these students transferred in without losing anything, we couldn't put them in the general study. They would actually add one or two semesters to their uh, college tenure thus increasing their cost. So the BAS allows for a much smoother transition. They're able to apply everything they've learned. We can add the general, uh, our general education degree, uh, excuse me, courses during their course of study to finish out and fulfill that obligation for baccalaureate in Louisiana. And then they'll be able to take the managerial courses later. So we did study the general studies aspect of it. And unfortunately, in most cases, it added at least one or two semesters to the degree. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Any further questions, comments? Uh, all those in favor signify, f signify by saying uh, yay. Yay. Opposed say nay. <laughs> uh, the motion passes. Uh, next up is item number five, the governor's military and veteran friendly campus report. Dr. Yeah. Denley, uh, please proceed. Thanks so much. Yeah, so happy to, to, to share this report. We, uh, th this is an, an, an annual report, really it has been for the last uh, nine years since 2015 when this, uh, when this program was first created. And this uh, Governor's Military and Veteran Friendly Campus designation is a way for our campuses to really uh, fulfill a variety of different ways in which they can serve our both veteran and military family uh, students on their campuses. So when the designation was first put in place, it really created a variety of different deliverables, ways in which campuses would be required to uh, serve those students on that campus to then earn that designation. What I'm happy to tell you is that this year, um, and uh, this is the ninth year of the program, but this is, uh, it is now the case that all 28 institutions in the state, as well as uh, one private institution you'll see on the list in just a second, uh, all have that baseline designation. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, that, that's a, a, on, the, on the first hand, a big testimony to the support that our campuses have for military students and their families. So you can see all 28, as well as Louisiana Christian University in LACU, who all have that baseline designation. So as well as that, uh, we have now uh, been tracking across our campuses the numbers of students who uh, are, are being served in this way. And actually, uh, these numbers are increasing across our state, which is exactly the trend that we would like to see. So serving, these are new students, an additional almost 1,300 new veterans who are being served. Uh, and then, of course, many of those students are going on and they're earning uh, degrees with us, and we're delighted to see that. As well as that, last year, uh, through Act 53, uh, of the legislative session, we were uh, asked to create, to build on that sort of baseline designation. And I should add, that sort of baseline designation now has been proliferated to a, a several other states who have also created similar kinds of programs to sort of, to encourage institutions to have that sort of baseline of, of service. What we've done is really to build on that, to now build tiers of recognition. So, so campuses are still welcome to have that baseline designa designation, and we certainly would encourage them all to, to continue to do that. But as well as that, we have created these tiers, bronze, silver, and gold tiers, to recognize increased, uh, increased services that campuses offer. 
So those tiers are created based on which or if, or, or, or if campuses provide, for instance, a veteran center, uh, an ongoing peer mentor system, dedicated financial aid and advising services, specific counseling services for veteran students as their families, uh, speci specifically designed degree pathways to serve those students, flexible course taking, as you might imagine when people are deployed, we want to make sure that that doesn't mean that they aren't able to continue their studies. And then lastly, some kind of additional graduation event that really recognizes the the success of these students. The way that this is set up is to, to be bronze. You have to have at least two of these, uh, be, deli be delivering at least two of these. To be silver, you have to deliver uh, the Veterans Center and another three of those services. And then to be gold, of course, gold is the whole, the whole shebang, everything on, everything on the list. And, uh, and, uh, and so what I'm happy to do is to show you the very first uh, designation of those tiers, and I'm going to work work my way through the systems one at a time. You can see that uh, the uh, the LSU system, each of the four campuses, all earned the silver designation. Uh, several of those were really, really close to gold, so I'm sure that they are excited about putting that dotted I and cross T to be gold next year. Uh, in the southern system, uh, the SUSLA, the S Southern University Shreveport, is at the the bronze designation. Uh, in the uh, UL system, you can see that uh, we have ca campuses both in silver and bronze, and Grambling uh, uh, being silver with, together with Northwestern, Southeastern, uh, ULL, University of Louisiana Monroe, and you can see several campuses at the bronze level. And then you can also see uh, Louisiana Christian University also earning the bronze designation. And then lastly, but certainly not least, you can see that we have the, see the campuses there at, uh, in the LCTCS system who have earned those various des designations. And I'm really so excited to, 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 to see that, uh, that school earning the gold designation. Many congratulations to, uh, to Bossier Parish Community College uh, for being the, the first school in the state to earn that gold designation. I think it's just really very exciting. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I kind of wanted to. I wanted to get the finale at the end. We should have loved with that. Credits and all that. Kind of want to keep the best till last. You know, you don't do barely. Can we do the Paris theme song like you do at the Olympics? Right, the only gold medal gets that theme song played, right? So I can't, uh, I can't quite do that, but and uh, I know I, I did, so I, I'm sad that uh, Dr. Bateman was not able to be with us today uh, because of ill health. But but I, I know that uh, Dr. Palermo is here from. LCTCS, so happy to invite her up to, uh, to share a few words, if she would. Are you going to sing the theme song? So 
So I'm also joined today by uh, Secretary McGinley and, uh, and, his, uh, and his team and happy to invite them to the table. I know they're also excited about this work and just the ways that our campuses are supporting. Yes, ma'am. Supporting the war, and I want to congratulate this to Iris Station at Barksdale on Global Strike Commission. And so these are veterans who, on the bomber, when we go throughout the globe and fight, are always you know, prepared. Most people don't know. Uh, the bomber wing is the largest bomber wing in our nation, and so thank you and congratulations for that goal. Well, um, Chairman May, uh, members of this board, uh, I'm Charlton McGinley. I'm the Secretary for Veterans Affairs here in the state. Uh, and this is truly one of the biggest privileges that I could ever have, is to be able to serve veterans even after I've retired from the Air Force. And so it's, uh, it's definitely our honor and privilege to be able to get, get up here and, and kind of give you a little, about, a little bit of our perspective, where we want to go as a DVA and some of the things that we really are, are kind of taking on going forward. I've got with me my Deputy Secretary, Jerome Buller, and uh, our State Approving Agency um, Director, essentially, uh, Tamar Joseph. And in the back, I've got my Executive Counsel, Connor Junkin, and Mr. Cleo Wallace as well, who helps approve the GI Bill uh, uh, materials. Uh, as we started looking in this transition of, of how we can strengthen Louisiana through veteran leadership, one of the things that we kept coming back to is what are we doing as an agency on the GI Bill front? And so we really started digging into this and started looking at the numbers. And I think that as, as a department, I really want to start pressing schools to continue to recruit more GI Bill recipients. I will tell you all, uh, my daughter is on my GI Bill. She's at LSU. She is living her best life on the GI Bill. And, but it gave her an opportunity to essentially not have to have any college debt, obviously. And so what we are proposing to many of the institutions right now is, y'all need to be thinking about doing a marketing campaign. How do you draw in uh, students into your communities and into your schools through the GI Bill? Obviously, when we think of GI Bill, you think of just paying the tuition, but of course, you get the stipend for housing, which gets pumped into the communities. And so it used to be that the value of the GI Bill was about $100,000 over four years. I actually think that number is now substantially higher, uh, but I don't have the data to prove that just yet. But even at $100,000 a GI Bill recipient, that's still a significant amount of money that's being pumped into the school and then pumped into the economy as well. Uh, Torrance will give you some of the numbers that we have, but we really think this is an incredible opportunity for our schools. One thing that I also want you all to know is I am a ULM graduate. I'm an LSU graduate. Dr. Buller is an LSU medical graduate, and you went to ULL? ULL. Yeah. USL. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, and I, I'm retired from the, from the Air Force. I did 20 years. I was a judge advocate uh, in the Air Force. Dr. Buller was a medical doctor in the military. And I think it's really important for all of our military and veteran students to know you can get a quality education in Louisiana on the GI Bill and have very successful careers once you leave the school. I think my career was pretty good. I know Dr. Buller's career was really good. And I think that's, a, that's an incredible message. I think Louisiana schools are standing up to other states when it, when it comes to producing quality graduates. And I would like to think that, that maybe I'm just a, a small bit of proof of that, certainly Dr. Buller. So uh, GI Bill is one of the things that we were working on. The second thing is, uh, the, the designation of military, essentially military campuses. One of the things that we're gonna propose is uh, maybe a redesignation or a rebranding of that to Purple Star Universities. Right now, that's a national movement. And I think if we rebrand it to be akin to what most other states are doing, it will get a little bit more visibility with what y'all are doing in terms of having that recognition from states uh, essentially border regents to students who are saying, yeah, I want to go to a school, but I want to make sure that they understand my needs are being met as a veteran or as a service member. And we're going to push out a little bit more detail of kind of what our vision is that on that coming up soon. I, I, I want you all to know that that is a really big push just nationally to kind of be aligned with what other states are doing. And then the third thing is ACE. Some of y'all may know the conversions for professional military education transferring into college credit. The state of Tennessee right now has an incredible website that shows that conversion of what certain military courses are transferring into college credits. Sure. I would very much like to see 
something that if you're a military, uh, if you're an active service member, or if you're a veteran, and you have certain courses, say, say uh, non-commissioned officer training, where would that transfer into a certain school when it comes to that degree program? Does it actually go to my uh, degree program itself, or is it an elective? That could be a decision that could drive a service member in determining what school he or she may want to go to. So these are three of the big initiatives that we're looking at right now. Uh, like I said, I, I, eight months ago, if you had told me I was going to be digging into this as much as I have, I, I would have said, well, okay. Now it's really become a passion because I really believe that our colleges and universities are drivers, especially when it comes to military leadership and veteran leadership and keeping those graduates in our communities to strengthen our communities even more. Because when you get a veteran, you're not just getting someone who had a GI Bill, you're getting someone who has very different education through the military, experiences and trainings that will really enhance our communities, especially in the career fields that we desperately need in this state. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Buller and let him talk a little bit about uh, kind of our vision on Purple Star. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Joseph, Lieutenant Colonel, soon to be Joseph in the Army National Guard. Yes. And uh, he'll kind of walk you through a little bit of information. One last note, sorry, I'm getting really excited. Bipsy, uh, we, I was up there two weeks ago. I saw it, I was amazed, I was floored. What they're doing for our veterans is absolutely trending. Uh, I think they're the trendsetter for the state. But LSUS is also doing a great job LSUA is doing a good job. Southeastern is doing a fantastic job. I see this in our schools as I've gone to visit them. And I'm really just, I, I, I think at some point we're gonna get to the point where each of them are gonna realize, I'm gonna start competing against you and see how I can outdo you. Because they realize the value of, of the, these initiatives. And uh, I, I think there's some big things coming for Louisiana. And I really think that this board as the leader uh, for education can really kind of help us uh, accomplish these goals. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bullock. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished board members, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you today. Bottom line is, is that we exist, the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs exists to relentlessly advocate for our service members, our veterans, their family members, uh, and to ensure that they receive the benefits that they have earned in service to our country. Um, the GI Bill and, and their educational endeavor is a huge part of that. I just wanted to foot stomp something the Secretary said, and that is it's not only the veterans, it's the family members. And we will have more and more family members who are, you know, basically able to um, uh, take advantage of the GI Bill. So we certainly appreciate your support in that. The legislation on the books now with the governor's military and veteran-friendly campuses. It's very, very similar, very consistent with the Collegiate Purple Star campuses program that is going across the nation. Right now, Texas, Florida, and Ohio have uh, legislation on the books uh, supporting this. Um, and I think with your continued support and our uh, assistance, whether that's directly from this leadership team or with our Levette Corps navigators, which are on a number of your campuses, uh, we are here to partner with you and to make sure that this benefit is uh, optimized across the state for the benefit not only of our veterans and their families, but of our state as well. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Torrance for a few numbers that he can share. Good morning to the board. Uh, it's a privilege to, to be able to sit in front of you this morning. Uh, uh, I work with the State Approval Agency, and our director here is Mr. Cleo Wallace, and I'm an education program consultant. And real quick, just what we do as a State Approval Agency, we approve all of the educational programs on college campuses for GI Bill usage. So as was presented earlier with the new programs, once those programs are approved by the board, then the schools will let us know, and then we will approve those programs for GI Bill usage. We conduct supervisory visits and risk-based visits on campuses. For of the educational facilities. And one measure when we review uh, is prior credit evaluation. And I'd like to speak on that for, for uh, a second. For the prior credit evaluation, as Secretary McGinley discussed, this is uh, with states like Tennessee and Minnesota. They have a, a web database where the service members can put in their military occupation, and it will produce 
all of the uh, accepted credits. What we found in Louisiana is that some schools are accepting credits, but there are no credit agreements. So we would uh, like at some point, maybe in the future, uh, we'll be open to work, working with the board on some credit agreements so that we can establish a database so that veterans understand uh, which credits are accepted at, at which schools. Uh, another thing that was mentioned already was ACE, uh, how to review for prior credit. We've also found that a lot of schools understand that ACE is out there. However, uh, they're not properly utilizing ACE. So we will be open to well, working with the schools to understand how to read a joint service transcript to transfer uh, this transcript from military language to an actual college articulation. And what we found uh, in the last year or so, we've had uh, 9,600 veterans that were uh, attending in the school year 22-23, and in the school year 23-24, that number has increased to 10,600 veterans, and we think that that's that's uh, a real credit to our schools, especially our schools along the border, such as your uh, Bipsies, but also your McNeese's and your Southeasterns, where veterans have an option to attend a school in Texas or in Louisiana. Those border schools have made themselves attractive en enough that they're choosing to go to school here. Uh, and, uh, so, and the last thing is that, um, with with the, the the database that is that is available uh, there's some examples that are out there and if possible if we could get a small work group where we can review some of the some of the options that are out there that uh, I showed Secretary McGinley and he got very excited about uh, and so we, we would really like to share that instead of sitting on this information and just keeping it to ourselves so thank you with that, we'll close. Uh, one other number I'd like to throw out to y'all. Uh, I think the number is $166 million is the current value of the GI Bill in the state of Louisiana. $166 million federal dollars pumped into our colleges and universities. Imagine if we had 10 more million or 50 more million or doubled it, how much more that would strengthen our schools. And uh, I, I think when you start throwing out numbers and data, uh, it gets real interesting as to, all right, what can we do to, to get a little bit more of that? So uh, ultimately, those dollars not just help the veterans, but they help all students on the campus. So with that, I'll take any questions if you have any. If not, thank you very much for allowing us the time to come up and speak to you all today. As far as the GI Bill, uh, since 1942. So, so we came in with the governor when he came in eight months ago. Um, I know Torrance and his team have been working on this with respect to you know, essentially approving the GI Bill. And so I think when we came in, this was one of the things that I wanted to do was, you know, the governor talked about come home Louisiana, right? Well, this is a way that we get our veterans and, and folks to come back home is, is by making sure that they understand what we're doing. Oftentimes, I don't, I don't know if they actually knew a lot of this. We've got to get them the information. We've got to make sure they understand what's transferable, what schools are going to take care of them with their particular background and their needs. And, and that's what we're doing right now. It's, it's more, uh, I'm a lawyer, not a marketer, but that's kind of what we're trying to do now is m help market our schools to this very specific population <coughs> who have a lot of resources backing them. Mr. Temple, if I understand your question, I think the answer is also that it was in the 2017 session that the legislation that the legislation passed that uh, prompted this board to be doing the work around the governor's military and veteran friendly campus. Yes, sir. Okay. Before you all leave, I do want to, to thank you for the partnership. We had a, a meeting, I guess it was just a week or so ago, 
uh, to talk about how do we better market and talk about Louisiana's institutions as exceptional places to get your education for veterans and their families. Uh, and so this is just perfect timing for us to hear from you all. Do know that we won't have you sit on the information. Dr. Denley will be ready uh, to visit with you. Um, and um, Colonel McGinley, I know you mentioned um, about perhaps there could be some friendly competition between the institutions. Note that, Mr. Chairman, we've already had two requests for a recount on the gold medal. Uh, so campuses are looking at this to say, how did Bipsy get there and how can we get there? And ultimately that competition will result in even better services for these individuals who have served our country so, so well. So we're excited about it. We're thrilled that you had the time to come and be a part of our day today. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, so uh, to return to the agenda, uh, uh, senior staff recommend the approval of the uh, 29 institutions having the governor's military friendly uh, recognition and then also uh, the, the various tiered designations for the campuses as presented today. All right, thank you, Tristan. Uh, again, we'd like to extend our congratulations to Dr. Bateman and the Bossier Parish Community College for their gold uh, tier status. And we'd like to also thank Secretary McGinley Dr. Buller and Mr. Joseph for their service and comments. Mm -hmm. Certainly tell they're passionate and committed to this initiative. Uh, is there a motion to approve the 2024 governor's So military? moved. Okay. Uh, campus report. Uh, motion by, who is that? Regent Aubrey. Regent Aubrey, second? Second. Uh, by Regent Finley. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor uh, signify by saying yay. Yay. Uh, opposed say nay. The motion passes. Uh, Dr. Denley, I believe you have an update uh, about the academic planning for next month. Yeah, just real briefly. So uh, you'll remember that uh, we now ask all of the campuses each year to create uh, academic plans uh, a year, two year, three year uh, across time. And then we have an <coughs> opportunity then to bring all of those academic plans together uh, to have those, uh, to view those in the in the in the context of uh, what low producing programs they might have, what programs they are looking to to bring to an end, what programs that they have had uh, recently approved, but also to think about that from the perspective of strategically building the capacity that we need across the state to meet the state's economic needs. Uh, those plans are being reviewed right now. They are also being reviewed by regional economic development offices, and we are meeting each with, with each of those in turn to discuss the plans uh, as they are envisaged in their region. We're also having meetings with, uh, with LED and the Workforce Commission. And so lots of reviewing that's happening right now. I'll be happy to bring uh, that, that, that report as part of our uh, September uh, meeting. Thank you. Is there any more business <clears throat> to, come, <clears throat> to come before this committee? And with regard to those reports, will it also take in consideration the anticipated reduction in the enrollment numbers? So the, the, the way that the plan uh, unfolds would be a plan, so a plan as might be envisaged, as you say, if if appropriate uh, financial resources exist. There isn't a, by, by saying this is a vision, it doesn't necessarily say how long the vision might take to actually come to, uh, to fruition. Yeah. So by saying that this is a vision, it is still the case that all of the campuses have to bring each of those individual programs to us with all of the I's dotted, all of the T's crossed, <coughs> they all are presented to you in the normal way, and of course, whether or not you would or would not approve those new degrees would very much be a function of right. where but they would be. But yeah. you, you also mentioned low completers and those kind of things. And we talked about this, and we went through this in the budget exercise last year. Yeah. I mean, we have to be more efficient with the resources. And we know, at least it's anticipated, that there will be a reduction in, in budget and allocation. So they have to be in alignment. That's right. And so I don't think it would be prudent for us to not address those issues. Agreed. So if there are programs that are teetering in terms of hitting what we establish as minimum numbers mm -hmm. um, 
for completions or the graduation numbers as we talked about then we should have conversations with those we should put those we should spell that out and I wish there was a way we could incentivize institutions that are forthcoming and saying you know we have this program but it's not as attractive like it used to be and if we can incentivize them let them keep some of the money yeah. but if they can show they can reduce you know head count and reduce make some reductions but that's just my perspective we got to be a lot more uh, I won't use the word forceful but we got to encourage them to be efficient and you've given us the enrollment trends nationally and we see it in the numbers the FTE number they'll put a press release and show enrollments up but when you pull the layers back the, the full-time equivalent numbers are down across many of these systems so we have to be more efficient, and that's what I hope to be looking at next month. Well, I'd be happy to show you all that we have. As, as I say, the, it is no longer the case. It used to be the case, no longer the case, that now new degree programs are considered just in isolation. We ask them to paint that whole picture, the new programs that they are anticipating, but also what does it look like about the things that we have that you have started recently and what does it look like on the programs that, as you say, are not producing all that they might and what are you telling us about programs that you are requesting to to bring to an end exactly because they maybe they've come to the end of their appropriate life so it's all in that big picture and of course I, I know you you, you you know well that next uh, the, the September meeting is exactly the meeting where we present the whole budget so all of this is presented as one you know one, one big and interconnected picture in exactly the way that it should be. Well last year we didn't spend enough time as I've been told you know asking questions of those system heads and so I'll make sure that we you know we need to add a little bit more than the lunch hour to do that. All right. So you'll have plenty of time. We have a full day uh, for our budget hearings in Definitely. September. I just want to um, add to Tristan's point. We do not discuss uh, statewide academic planning without also discussing low completers and programs that should be terminated. Campuses, I do think, realize now that the resource that you may need for your great new program may be the resource you're using on a program that's low completer yep. so you're redirecting resources mm -hmm. instead of expecting new resources um, so i just want to make sure uh, region aubrey that you we, we are answering your question that that will be part of the conversation well we saw last year northwestern was very forthright in addressing some of their enrollment issues yes um, we've heard about UNO and how they are addressing some of their budget issues. Right. I'm not hearing it across some of the other campuses in which we know that those situations are real. Yes. And, uh, and from what we heard from the administration, um, the proposal for higher education will be re reduced. So we, we should take that on as a challenge and, 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 and get real information. So enough of that for me. Regent Aubrey, I fully agree and I want to <coughs> echo with Commissioner saying I think the lessons, some of the lessons learned from last year as well as the preparation for belt tightening that's going to be necessitated potentially by the budget challenges uh, is something that we've been working with. Matthew and I and the Commissioner have been working a lot on these fiscal health watch reports and what those look like on a quarterly basis and working with the systems to ensure that they're aligned with providing that information so that we're not looking back only at audited data that has a significant lag time, but also projecting out what future quarters can look like so we can anticipate problems as they happen. And so I fully echo and support um, what you're pushing for here, both in uh, on the campuses and the systems looking for efficiencies, but also at Regents and how we look in our own organization of consolidating efficiency in our back office. The limited resources we have end up in the hands of students wherever possible. And I had a question, just this is my first time to, to attend one of these. Will this, will this data also include graduation rates and if these students stay in state? The, the data about whether or not students stay in state, will uh, we, we need to wait for the longitudinal data system, uh, LA First, to be created to really be able to shed good light on that. But certainly we have data about numbers of completers and, uh, and, and those kinds of graduation statistics, and we can certainly provide that, absolutely. All right, yeah. thank you. No, sure. Regent Cordell, the, there was legislation passed, not in this most recent session, but in the session prior, that for the first time will give us the ability to look at that longitudinal data. 
I can't say the word like Christian can. He's so much better at this. But we'll, we'll finally be able to answer that question that we never have had the ability to connect the data on before. So we are very much looking forward to that and eagerly anticipating the first release of that report. That's right. Thank you. All right. Is there any uh, other business to come before this committee? Any There's questions one. or comments? <clears throat> uh, hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, uh, Regent Finley, uh, the second, uh, Regent Aubrey. Any discussion, any questions? All those in favor of signify by saying yay. 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 Opposed by saying nay. Motion passes, we are adjourned. Thank you, Dr. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move on to Research and Sponsored Initiatives Committee. I'll ask Regent Finley, please, to call the committee to order. Yes, ma'am. Chair Finley? Here. Vice Chair May? Here. Regent Cordell? Here. Regent Meir? Regent Pryor? Here. Regent Weil? Here. You have a quorum. Absolutely. Uh, I am happy to say, Regent Aubrey, that this item actually speaks to the point you were making earlier. Uh, we come with a request from the University of New Orleans to divide an endowed chair, the Schleter Chair in Urban Waste and Research, uh, divided into four endowed professorships, all four in engineering. Uh, I say this is related to the previous point because the, the Schleter Chair was established in 1994, 30 years ago. It is very specific and very narrow in focus, looking at urban waste disposal and research. Uh, UNO is now requesting, because that program is not at the level it needs to be, they are now requesting to repurpose those dollars to create four endowed professorships in engineering. They're much more broadly drawn. The donor has provided permission uh, to make this change, and the UL System Board has approved it, and we are bringing this for your approval today. I'll repeat it. Well, it's been moved by Regent Weil, second by Regent May. Is there any discussion? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Robinson and members of the committee. Now we'll move on to the endowment program policy changes. We yes, ma'am. And, and Ms. Robinson, I know that we have previously um, gone over this and there's been a review that's been conducted over the last year that you've shared and pointed out to the board for its consideration and so now we're going to take it a step further and if you could share at this moment. Yes, happy to. Uh, this is the culmination of a two-year process to review all of the endowment programs established through the Board of Regents Support Fund and uh, determine some recommendations for policy changes that are needed at this point. We do this regularly in our endowment programs. We look across the policies and we see what is working, what's not, what's outdated, what's needed now, uh, and we make recommendations. The reason this process took two years is we hired NACUBO, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, to conduct a complete external evaluation of our policies and procedures and make some recommendations. That Those recommendations, the report they provided us, uh, was the foundation of the discussions we've had over the last year. This board saw that report exactly a year ago at the August meeting in 2023, and we then socialized that report throughout our network of stakeholders, both uh, institutions, foundations, as well as uh, donors to these endowments and other stakeholders across the state. We, uh, and, and this, what you'll see before you today is the culmination of that work. And it has been vetted, I will go through this in a minute, it has been vetted at every stage by all of our stakeholders. 
So first, to give you a little bit of context about our endowment matching programs, they are the largest and the longest running endowment matching programs in the country. Uh, they are very substantial uh, in the amount of money that we've been able to provide in match. We have generated $480 million in non-state contributions, most of those from private donors, a few of those from other sources of funds that are not state funds. We have matched those dollars with $320 million from the Board of Regents Support Fund. That $320 million, by the way, makes the support fund the single largest donor to higher education in the state of Louisiana. Um, the, that's about $800 million in corpus. I'll explain what corpus is in a minute. And that represents 32% of all the support fund dollars we have, uh, we have awarded since 1987 and the inception of the support fund. The market value of these funds in fiscal year 23, which is the last year for which we have data, was $1.2 billion. That represents 3,700 plus endowment slots because as the action before this one shows you, we can never put an exact number of, on the number of endowment slots because they often shift and change a little bit. Uh, the majority of those slots are in the endowed professorships program, about 75% in endowed professorships. In terms of the structure of a support fund endowment, when I say endowment, what exactly do I mean? What I mean is these are, we provide funds for restricted permanent accounts. So the money that we provide, the money that the private or the non-state donor provides, uh, goes into a restricted fund, the corpus of which cannot be touched. So for example, an endowed chair is a million dollar chair. We provide $400,000 to a donor, $600,000. That comprises the corpus. That corpus is inviolable. But any funds earned on that corpus, any income generated from that corpus can be used for designated activities. So to support, for example, the chairholder, the faculty work, the work of the, of the holder who is holding the chair. And that is as defined by the donors, by the submitting institution, and by the Board of Regents. Uh, typically, these funds are managed by uh, institutional foundations or development offices but they are always owned by the receiving campuses. The Board of Regents, in terms of managing these, these permanent funds, the Board of Regents provides a couple of different policy mechanisms. Uh, it's important to note that our policies apply only to matched endowment, endowments that have been matched through the support fund. Any endowed funds that an institution holds that are not matched by the support fund that is not, they are not subject to any of these policy provisions. An institution makes its own decisions about those. Uh, so we have program policies. These are general guidance on achieving programmatic goals. They set forth the goals and objectives of the programs, how the funds can be expended, how shareholders, scholarship holders, et cetera, can be appointed, how you request match, what the process is to have match reviewed and brought to the board for approval. And then we have an investment policy. It's an umbrella policy that applies to all of our endowment programs that governs, it sets the legal and policy parameters for the investment of the funds, the reaping of returns on the funds, and the annual agreed upon procedures report, which is basically an audit report that all participating institutions submit on their endowments. The other elements that govern endowments, it's not just our rules. There are other rules that govern the management of endowments. Donor agreements, these are all matched. So there is a private sector or a non-state source that's providing funding. They enter into agreements with the institution. Those agreements can be restrictive. They can define, as the Schleter Chair did, urban waste uh, disposal and research. That is the purpose of the endowment. That was not set by the regents. That was set by the donor. So the donor agreements can set various stipulations on the use of the funds. Uh, up MIFA, which is the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Fiscal Assets, is state law that governs how institutions and foundations uh, deal with the private donors to these funds, and it governs the investment and management of institutional funds. And then the Louisiana Constitution 
not in the support fund section, but in a separate uh, funding section, stipulates that no more than 35% of any public contribution to these endowments can be invested in stocks. So the support fund portion is limited to 35%, not because of anything this board did, but because of the language in the Constitution. Just a timeline of these policy revisions. As I said, it's been, it's been a year, exactly a year from August 23 to now. We went through several steps to make sure that the stakeholders knew what we were doing, why we were doing it, uh, and we got their feedback. We made lots of adjustments based on the feedback we received. We conducted listening sessions. We recorded all these listening sessions and posted them online. We invited written responses from any stakeholder who wished to submit one. We developed staff recommendations in draft and we sent those out to the campuses for, com or for to all the stakeholders for comment. We received comments back. We made additional tweaks and changes. We sent them back out again. We received a few additional comments. We made a few more tweaks and changes. Uh, and we sent the final recommendations out to, the, to all of the stakeholders who were on our list at the same time that we sent them out to all of you for consideration. So that brings us to today when we are asking for your consideration of the policy revisions. You do have in your board materials a complete uh, account in the attachment of all the policy revisions in more detail uh, that we are recommending today, but I'm gonna go through just a big overview of the, the revisions that we are recommending. We are recommending revisions. There are four different types of revisions. They're program-based revisions, so these are specific to individual programs. They're general revisions that are, that are across all of the program policies. And they're investment policy revisions, which are just to the investment policy. And then there are a few actions that won't be rolled into policy, but they relate to staff outreach and information provision to the campuses and to the board. So those will be outside of policy, but things that we're asking you to approve us to do. So in terms of program-based, chairs and professorships are the two programs that have program-based policy revisions. Uh, if you remember the Nakubo report, you'll remember that one of the biggest concerns was that our base endowment level in endowed chairs, which as I said is a million dollars, across all disciplines, across any campus type, that that is too low. That is not aligned with national norms. So we are recommending an increase in the base endowment level, but only on a limited basis based on Carnegie classification of institutions. So research institutions, R1s, R2s, uh, have a, will have a higher expectation, but largely in STEM and business chairs, these are the high dollar disciplines, the high cost disciplines, where it is difficult to recruit faculty uh, unless you have a significant investment uh, in those faculty holders. So we are recommending an increase in base endowment levels, which will essentially establish a differential endowment matching. It will be the same proportion, 60-40, but it will be at different levels. We, as we always have, will allow an institution always to seek a higher endowment than the minimum, but we, what we are setting is a floor, not a ceiling. We are also uh, proposing to retain the national search waiver provision. We looked extensively at that uh, because we were receiving so many requests for waiver to appoint internal shareholders or internal uh, candidates to chairs without a national search. So that is not consistent with the goals and objectives of the program uh, or with our constitutional goals and objectives. So what we're, rec what we're recommending is a cap on the number of submissions we will accept in a year from campuses. Uh, that cap is two chairs or 5% of the campuses total number of chairs. So we did make provisions for campuses who have very small numbers of chairs versus campuses who have very large numbers of chairs uh, to allow them to request a limited number and to add new documentation requirements. So essentially a campus will have to justify uh, why this is meeting our constitutional goals, why this is meeting our program goals to make this appointment internally rather than going out on national search. Uh, endowed professorships, we changed up a couple of things about uh, around the guaranteed match rate. We had a guaranteed match rate at 60-40 until 2016. That was across the board. 
We changed the match rate to 80-20, largely because of financial constraints. We were not able to continue the 60-40 match rate uh, at the level the support fund is earning at this point. Uh, but we set an exception where a campus with fewer than 15 could, could apply at the 60-40 rate, and these are guaranteed matches, uh, until they reached that 15 number. That number was somewhat arbitrary, so what we did was we, we looked at other states and what other states are doing in terms of how many faculty are covered by endowments. And we determined that the 60-40 ratio would be appropriate uh, for when a campus has fewer than 20% of its faculty who can be uh, supported on a faculty endowment. So that is the threshold that we're recommending now. Everyone above that threshold would be at the 80-20, but still, uh, we would decouple guaranteed matching from a dollar amount. So every campus is guaranteed two slots, regardless of whether that's a 60-40 slot or an 80-20 slot, every campus is guaranteed two slots. I would remind you that typically we don't get enough applications from campuses that every campus is limited to those two slots. Usually campuses with more submissions get the extras that are left over when every campus has gotten there too. And finally, uh, we are going to convene a statewide discussion. There was interest in more discussion of a possible shift from professorships, but retaining that option to a more department-based supplementary endowment model. So allowing donors to support a department, not in terms of operating costs, those are prohibited in the Constitution, but in terms of providing supplementary support for departments of their choosing to receive more endowed funds to underpin that, uh, those operating dollars. Are there any questions at this point? It could be tied to a faculty member, it could be tied to student support and so a student would receive an honorific, you know, that they are receiving the, you know, Joe Smith travel award for like a, graduate students going to conferences. There are different ways that institutions can recognize they can, they could name a room or a lab. Uh, we leave the naming, to the, the, the naming provisions to the campuses, but there are various ways that an institution could recognize a donor in in a more public facing manner. We do have, some campuses do have those kinds of endowments, but they're not matched because we've never, off, never offered the opportunity for matching. And this is in response to campuses telling us that what they really need is flexibility. In endowments, their concern is you have an endowed chair and that endowed chair earns money, but say it goes vacant and it's vacant for a couple of years because you can't find just the right person. They want some flexibility in those dollars to, to put them in the areas of greatest need. And so this is a discussion that we want to have to see if there's a way to provide more flexibility to the institutions while retaining the supplementary support character of the support fund. Absolutely. The donor, per up MIFA state law, the donor is always in control. The donor's wishes are always paramount. So a donor can restrict things in a, a large number of ways as long as they're legal. So as long as it's not violating another law, a donor can, can absolutely restrict contributions. Typically, uh, typically, like, a, as with the UNO uh, the action that we just took, it's the institution and the foundation that will go back and talk to donors about making changes that they, that they want to see. And then what we do because of the way the funds are allocated within the support fund, that's why we bring them to you when they make that change so that we can formalize that change from one program to another. But as we do now, if we establish a departmental enhancement model, and allowed match through the support fund and a campus wanted to convert 20 chairs to departmental enhancement, as long as those donors agree, then we will bring it to you, but it's, it's basically a pro forma approval because the donor has said, this is how I want my funds to be used.
sir. All right, I will move on to general program policy revisions. Uh, reporting, we want to make sure that we provide more reporting to you. We generally do not bring a lot of data to the board, so we are proposing to inform the board annually of the use of the endowment, compliance with minimum spending required vacancies, and any other notable data we see so that you can be informed about the value of these programs and the outcomes that we're seeing in these programs. Uh, we are going to provide increased guidance. That's one of the things that we heard from the campuses is we've always taken a general approach to the policies, especially regarding things like spending, and not been specific. You can spend in this category, but not that one, because a lot of times spending is dependent on exactly how you propose to do it. Uh, campuses want increased guidance. They want examples. They want some some clarity about how exactly they can use the money. So we propose to clarify and explicitly codify all of our guidelines, include any legal restrictions and requirements like the constitutional provision that I noted earlier, uh, so that campuses can know exactly what they're doing and that it's allowable. And we don't get quite so many questions about allowability. Um, and we're also going to include specific language that sets forth allowable and unallowable uses. So. As I said, you cannot use uh, any of these funds for general operations. You can, however, use these funds for salary supplement. You can use them for equipment purchases. For startup costs, there's a lot of confusion around using these dollars for startup costs for faculty. That's completely allowable. We will make that clear. And finally, as I said, campuses are very inst interested in flexibility. And one of the ways in which they would like some flexibility is when you have the donor pot of money, that, that donor pot's earning money, our pot is earning money, we can separate those in terms of the income received to relieve some of the campuses from state restrictions on, say, travel costs. So only the donor part of the money could be used for this, but you wouldn't have to comply with meal restrictions except as imposed by the institution. So this is just to give them a little more flexibility in terms of how they can use the dollars that they're getting. Investment policy revisions, this, this policy has been the one that is, has been least revised, so we are going to do a real overhaul of this to clarify the intersection of the non-state donor and the, support fund con and, and the support fund contributions. So how are we restricted in ways that the donor portion is not? How can the donor portion be expended in ways that that support fund cannot? And so on. We are going to change agreed upon procedures or basically audit guidelines to standardize those contents so all of those reports look the same when they come to us. But also, again, to give campuses a little bit of relief to say if you have no findings and no material issues noted in your AUP, then you get three years off. You don't have to do another one for three years. Now they do them annually. They cost a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to manage these funds. And so this will give them some relief on that side. And finally, uh, there's a lot of interest. We have various caps on portfolio composition in our current investment policy. There's always an interest in revisiting those and seeing if we can provide more flexibility. So we're going to convene a study committee comprised not only of people at the Regents, people at Treasury, but also stakeholders ac across the spectrum, campuses, foundations, and even some investment managers that who are outside the foundations that the institutions want to include. And finally, additional staff engagement. We have been asked, and we currently do host webinars. We have one next week. If any of you want to tune in and watch us talk about endowment reporting requirements, we have a webinar for that. Uh, we host webinars. Uh, we will provide some additional written program guidance. There's been a request for a how-to manual. We are certainly open to providing that. Uh, we will provide program information sessions. We currently already do that. We do, again, webinars. We'll go to campuses and talk to applicants uh, about how they apply for new funds. Uh, we're going to collect additional data, follow up on all findings in area of con areas of concern, conduct regular audits of institutional accounts. We've never had the capacity to do auditing of these accounts. We do now and are going to start that this year. And we're, as I said, going to report to the regents on program impacts so that you understand uh, what return we're getting for our, our very large investment in these dollars. So with that, 
The senior staff recommends approval of the endowment program and investment policy changes as presented. Uh, we are trying to give the institution significant time to adjust to these changes. So with the exception of the national search waiver provision, uh, we are which would be effective immediately, we're requesting an effective date of July 1st, 2025. We will take the intervening time to prepare the policy language in specifics and circulate it to all our stakeholders and make sure that we're ready to go by July 1st, 2025. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you for your report. Committee members, you've heard the recommendation of the senior staff regarding the policy changes to the endowment program and the investment policy changes. Is there a motion to approve these changes? It's been moved by Regent May. Is there a second? been moved by Regent Cordell. Is there, is there any additional discussion? Not on the committee, but I just have a question. Uh, I think this is a lot of work, and I think it's very good that you're bringing it, bringing forward recommendations that, um, that makes it easier to manage in today's environment. And I think this is going to be very helpful to many of the institutions. Some have more sophisticated foundations, investments mm -hmm. that can manage and deal with this. Mm -hmm. My question would be, and I, I heard it, that you had the consultants, and they're very reputable. But uh, how was the outreach to the HBCUs in Louisiana as well as the community colleges? Some of them are relatively young and may not have sophisticated development staff. I serve on a couple of foundation boards, and then I serve on the HBCU foundation board as well. So how was their input and involvement in this process? We received input from every system. We received some of, some of the input that we got was in listening sessions and some was in writing. Uh, but we reached out to individuals. We, we work with these people mm -hmm. every day. Uh, I have done this program since 2010, and now we have a senior endowment programs manager or administrator, and he and I have tag team to make sure that we reach out to all of these people. We talk to them every day. So we networked both our personal connections and we posted everything on the web, we sent out emails, we had a, a mailing list of about 250 people that we emailed out to every time we had something for their review. Uh, we networked it through the webinars, we, we begged for participation in this process and we, we received participation from every system and from about, about 20, campus, 20 individual campuses participated in this process so okay I, I just want to make sure I'm very passionate about those smaller institutions yeah. and those HBCUs who may not have 15 you know chairs or whatever those yeah. numbers are and to make sure and I saw some accommodations for those institutions uh, but what I don't I just don't want later when we out and about and someone said well you know y'all just passed this then I wasn't informed or engaged in that so and I'll tell you one of the ways I, I really have to congratulate the the public institution foundations in the state they have their own working group that includes all of the foundations across all of the institutions because as you know institutional kind of foundation so they actually networked this out on our behalf. They made sure that all of their members were aware that these, that these provisions were coming down. We work uh, very closely with both uh, a community college foundation representative from SLCC and with the LSU Foundation in getting these networked out to that group. So that, that group was very well informed, not thanks to us, but thanks to that foundation group making sure that that was the case. Well, thank you, and, and job well done. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or concerns? Seeing none, can we have a vote? All those in favor of the staff recommendation for the changes signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes. Ms. Robinson, I want to thank you. I want to echo 
what uh, Regent Aubrey said. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I thank you for the work that you do. It's clear that it's well prepared. You're committed. It's thorough. Your team is passionate about this and we really appreciate the engagement and the outreach. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any other business to come before the committee? No other business. Hearing none, can I have a motion to adjourn? I have a motion by Regent Cordell. Is there a second? A second by Regent May. Any discussions? Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Family. Next up is statewide programs. I'll ask Regent Pryor, please, to call the committee to order. Chair Pryor, Regent Creed, Here. Regent Cordell, Here. Regent Levy, Here. Regent Weil, Here. Regent Orr. Here. Welcome, Regent Orr. You do have a quorum. Yes, sir. We will take up all of the consent agenda items in Globo. I can certainly elaborate on any of them if you need me to. Uh, the first one, the majority of these are going to be to codify and rule acts of the legislature. Uh, the first one is the MJ Foster Promise Program uh, changes. One of the major changes this past year was to gradually begin to reduce the age requirement. It was 21. As you may have recalled, there was legislation that said we should reduce it all the way to 17. The legislature decided to stagger that. So this year it will be 20. Next year you'll go down to 19 and 18 and 17. So it will be a gradual reduction in the age which could increase your participants, but that will also give you time to be able to look at the budget ramifications for that. The next one uh, in that particular uh, act, Act 102, that increased the maximum amount that could be appropriated to over $40 million. Now, while that increased your ceiling on MJ Foster, that doesn't mean that you got $40 million. So what was actually provided was level funding in 10.5, but if other revenue were to be recognized, you would have the ability to do so if JLCB allowed you to appropriate that or adjust your appropriation. We had that question with several individuals, so I wanted to cover it. The next rulemaking item is changes to TOPS. Um, some of you may have heard this on the news this morning. I did as well. Uh, this is not something that you are approving the existence of. This is legislation that has been passed. So you are approving the rulemaking that codifies that legislation result into rule. This is the computer science edition. It adds computer science as a graduation requirement, a top core requirement for TOPS Tech, as well as for TOPS Opportunity Performance and Honors. It basically gives students more options to be able to get that requirement in. If your Opportunity Performance and Honors, it could be a math elective, it could be a science elective, or it could be two units of your foreign language elective. If you're a TOPS Tech core, it could be as a part of your Jumpstart core, could be added there, or it could be math elective, science elective. The next agenda, a consent agenda item, any questions on the rulemaking before we go to exceptions? Okay. This is the home study exceptions. Uh, Regent Orr, uh, as you were new before, if a student did, was not able to begin home study, uh, they withdrew from public school, part, wherever they were, before the beginning of the 11th grade or after the beginning of the 11th grade. We would have to deny them tops because you have to complete your last two years. We had individuals that were being severely bullied. 
individuals that became ill and going to school in a regular brick and mortar was not an option for them. We had no provision to approve those exceptions. The legislature in its wisdom uh, allowed us to do that and so this is why you see these exceptions. These come to the Board of Regents. There are four um, this month for TOPS home study exceptions. The next category of exceptions is that if you are a TOPS recipient, again, for those of you that may be new to this, you have to maintain continuous full-time enrollment. And you have to make your 24 hours for the academic year. That's fall, spring, and summer. So you've got your shot, all right? So these are exceptions for students that were not able to meet those requirements through no fault of their own or students that could not meet the continuous enrollment requirement for MJ Foster. You also have that. There are 20 TOPS exceptions in this category and one MJ Foster exception in this category. Uh, Regent Orr, for you as well, and those that may be newer to this, there is a LASFA advisory board that's generally comprised of individuals from the financial aid community, counselors. So these are individuals that are very, very familiar with the programs that LASFA runs. They recommend uh, approval. They review all of these things that come to you beforehand and they recommend approval, and if they do, then they're passed on to the Board of Regents. The LASFA Advisory Board has recommended approval of all of the consent agenda items. Oh, th those are ongoing. Th those are ongoing. The home study exemptions, yes, we've been approving those for the past several years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a liaison, one of our outreach team members, that specializes in home study. So that individual can do other outreach events, but they have a particular concentration in making sure that we are getting information out to the home study community, home study groups. We also have individuals uh, that just as a general rule at LASFA kind of monitor the Facebook groups. And if we begin to see any opinions come up or facts come up that are less than factual, we don't engage in debates, that's not our job, but we will gently step in and say, hey, that's the way that really works, so that we make sure that parents have accurate information. I would say that that's probably more for your academic affairs staff to get with them. That isn't a function of loss with respect to dual enrollment yeah, and home we'll, study. We'll make sure of that. Uh, Tristan is still here. So we'll capture that, uh, Regent Pryor, and, and check in on that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we do have, okay, so we've got a second, and then we do have an other business item. The commissioner asked me to give you all an update. I don't see the slides on the FAFSA. Do you want me to just give a verbal update? I can do that. Did we get a full vote on that, Regent Pryor? There's no problem. I, I got it. Oh, no, wait, hold. Did we vote on the previous uh, well, motion? You had, a, you had a motion. Okay. okay. 
All right. Now I'll give your update. I don't know what happened to the slides. Okay, it's okay. All right. So the commissioner asked me to give you an update on the FAFSA, and it's a good thing that you don't have the slides because I actually have more up-to-date information. Uh, what you were going to see was August 9th. Uh, this is hot off the press. Uh, currently, at the, if you were looking at comparisons from this time last year to this year, at 20 in 2023 in August of August 18th. LASFA last year was at 70.1% completion rate on the FAFSA, and we were number one nationwide. This year, as you know, there have been changes in policy and views about the FAFSA and FAFSA completion. Even though those changes do not take effect until this coming graduating class, there are many individuals that felt like those were in effect before. You also had a FAFSA rollout this year that was significantly later than years before. And to say that there have been problems, challenges nationwide with the FAFSA rollout is what I like to call the biggest understatement since Noah said it looks like rain. So in view of all of that, we are at 60.4% at this time this year. Uh, we are third nationwide in our rank we are approximately 4,500 uh, FAFSAs down. If you take last this year last time and this year present, we're about 4,500 down. Commissioner, when, you all t when we talked earlier this uh, month, I think we were 5,000 down. Uh, we are actually tracking our efforts uh, by the week. Uh, last week, we added over 400 completions. The week before that, 294. The week before that, 272. So in addition to the outreach efforts that our team would be doing, we also applied for a grant from ECMC that was available to expand FAFSA outreach efforts and 400 completions or submissions in one week is pretty doggone good. So our team's still out there working. Uh, one of the other important things is the submission rate to completion rate. You can submit a FAFSA, and until you have everything in order, signatures, processes, it's not completed, right? So submitted and completed is important. At first, our, our ratio was 13.3%. When you compare submissions to completions, uh, as of May 4th, we have decreased that as of August 16th to 7.4%. So kudos to my team that's in the field uh, and on the phones helping students and parents. And that concludes my update. No, sir. Okay. Is there a, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Mr. Green. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Cordell. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Any more questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. No. Opposed, say no. Motion passes. We're adjourned. Thank you, Regent Pryor. Next up is the Planning, Research, and Performance Committee. I'll ask Regent Williams-Brown to please call this committee to order. I'd like to call the Planning, Research, and Performance Committee to order. Dr. Craig, will you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Chair Williams-Brown. Here. Vice Chair Aubrey. Here. Regent Cordell. Here. Regent David. Here. Regent Levy. Here. Regent Sterling. Regent Orr. Uh, Ma'am, we have a quorum. Thank you. We will now move to item three, the consent agenda. Dr. Craig, please proceed. Uh, yes, thank you. So we have a, um, a short agenda. I am very aware that I am between you and your lunch. So <laughs> I will make this as brief as possible. Uh, we have um, all of our items are on consent agenda. As you can see here, we have five um, institutions for academic licensure. The first institution is a Central Texas College. I'm gonna provide a few um, uh, pieces of information for each of you. Um, they have 201 students. Although the um, 
home campus is in Killeen, Texas. They have a satellite campus um, in Fort Johnson, Louisiana. Uh, Emory Riddle Aeronautical University, which is in Daytona Beach, Florida. Just to let you know, they were re they've been registered with the Board of Regents in the state of Louisiana since 1987, um, and they have 11 students at the Barksdale um, uh, the Barksdale base in Bossier. Uh, Infinity College, was, which is in Lafayette, has 30 students. Um, Upper Iowa University in Fayette, Iowa has 521 students, but they have lab um, instruction sites in Alexandria, Baton Rouge, DeRitter, Fort Johnson, and uh, New Orleans. And then our, the, last, um, the last site for renewal is Walden University with 571 students. Uh, this program is 100% online, however, they do have some in-person instruction as well as clinicals that, are, that occur here um, on site in Louisiana. The second item on the consent agenda um, are we have information from the Proprietary Schools Advisory Commission. We have a change of ownership application, which is a captain school, which occurs in New Orleans. Uh, to let you know that this, the new owners of this school um, are connected with um, a school in, in fact, they own a school in Florida. They were, they were connected with this school before and bought the previous owner out who was uh, retiring. The, um, an initial um, application is Louisiana Truck Driving Training in Tickfall, Louisiana, and the, the, the new owner has spent many years um, having a site where, where the truck drivers have to come do the assessments to earn their, um, to earn their uh, certification. And then the third application that we have here is for the Academy an Associate of Occupational Studies degree, and this is the Academy of Interactive Entertainment, also in Lafayette. They have several filmmaking degrees at this institution. Our last um, item on the consent agenda, we have 22 um, renewal applications for these proprietary schools. They have all been vetted by the Proprietary, proprietary Schools Advisory Commission. And uh, I'm happy to ans answer any additional questions. However, uh, senior staff recommends approval of all the items on the consent agenda. Thank you. You have heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to approve items on the consent agenda? Madam Chair, I move that we approve all items on the A and B for under the consent agenda. May I have a second? Second by Regent May. Any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Is there any other business to come before the committee? Uh, no, ma'am. Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Okay. Regent May, you can't second because you're not on my committee. May I have a second by committee? <laughs> <coughs> oh, thank you. For I think that. you love me that much. That's okay. Okay. Second by Mr. Levy. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Legal. But Levy, and may I have a second? Okay. Any discussion? Any questions? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <laughs> Motion passes and we are adjourned. All right. Thank you, Regent Williams Brown. Uh, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, we're running a little bit behind. Doreen, how do you feel about 1250? Sounds great, gives us a good 30 minutes. We'll be back here at 1250, 12.50. Thank you. Uh, but we are well fed and we thank the staff for feeding us. Um, I'd like to call the August Board of Regents meeting to order. Uh, members, please remember we are being streamed live, so you will need to turn on your microphones when recognized and speak directly in your microphone so that the virtual audience can hear you. Uh, Ms. Doreen, will you please call the roll? Sure. Regent Aubrey? Present. Regent Cordell? Here. Regent Creed? Here. Regent David? Here. 
Regent Finley? Here. Regent Levy? Here. Regent May? Here. Regent Meir? Regent Orr? Here. Regent Pryor? Here. Regent Seal? Regent Solomon? Here. Regent Sterling? Regent Temple? Regent Weil? Here. Regent Williams Brown? Is present. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Turin. Uh, members, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, public comments. Doreen, are there any public comments today? No, thank you. Hearing none, uh, we'll ask for other public comments um, in the other business section of our agenda toward the end. Members, you've got a copy of the June 12, 2024 meeting minutes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Thank you, Regent May. Is there a second? second. Regent Cordell, any discussion or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, saying nay. The motion passes. Uh, moving on to my comments. Uh, we have had a busy, busy summer uh, here at Regents. Um, a great summer, in fact, um, after coming out of a lengthy uh, legislative yes. session after a session after a session. Uh, last time we met, we welcomed our new student board member, Kennedy Orr. Uh, as is traditional for us, we'd like to hand the microphone over to Kennedy to give us an update uh, from the student perspective on the start of the new academic year. So Kennedy, the floor is yours, ma'am. All right, uh, thank you all. Um, it has been a very busy summer. I was in DC all summer, so trying to catch up on all things Louisiana during my time away, but now that I'm immersed into everything, I am just so excited for what is to come this year during my tenure, serving alongside all these amazing people and just serving all the public institutions in Louisiana. Um, as far as the student perspective, I mean, we are, you know, in classes just starting. I think our students are very excited for this year. We're having some hot weather, but it could be worse. So just praying that those hurricanes stay away from us so that we can have a smooth, fall semester with no interruptions. Um, enrollment is looking good, um, making sure that our students are completing the FAFSA like was talked about earlier. Um, we're doing our due diligence at Southern University and hoping to push that out to other institutions as well. Um, also, uh, my administration, we are working diligently on voter registration and we are also making sure that that spreads across to other campuses within the state of Louisiana and across the nation because that is super important. We are in a super important election year and we wanna make sure that our students are educated and ready to vote. Um, but with that being said, I am super excited and I will have more thorough information for you all at the next meeting. Thank you. Amazing, thank you, Kennedy. Uh, not only is Kennedy um, our new student board member, but she was also recognized as a 2024 HBCU scholar by the White House Initiative on HBCUs. She was one of nine Louisiana HBCU students from six different HBCUs to be named White House HBCU scholars. Uh, additionally, former student board member Chandler Vadreen is a graduate of Southern, uh, was also named to the 2024 HBCU scholars cohort as a graduate of Tennessee State. Uh, so Kennedy and the HBCU scholars will be invited to the 2024 HBCU week uh, national annual conference, which will be held in September in Philadelphia. So congratulations, Regent Orr, on that and all your accomplishments. Uh, this summer's seen two important steps taken uh, that have been made to meet the labor demands of our workforce, specifically around nursing. We want to update you on those. Uh, in July, Commissioner Reed spoke at the groundbreaking for Nichols State's Thibodeau Regional Health System School of Nursing building. Uh, this building is going to allow the campus to nearly double the number of nursing candidates in its undergraduate program. Uh, following the groundbreaking, uh, former uh, Regents Chair Marty Chabert and his family donated funds to name a scholarship in his wife's name, uh, the Elode Brown, uh, I'm sorry, Elodie. El Elodie Brown, I love that name, Elodie Brown Chabert Scholarship. The scholarship is going to be awarded to a full-time nursing student who is enrolled in the nursing program at Nichols, and we're proud of uh, former Chair Chabert for remaining involved in this work. Um, my first chair and I learned a whole lot from him uh, and he always said it's all about the students mm -hmm. and he's still prioritizing that in his giving. Uh, Commissioner Reed's been all over. She returned to the Bayou last week for the ribbon cutting and grand opening at the new Workforce and Allied Health and Nursing Building at Fletcher. 
uh, as well. Uh, with this addition, Fletcher's addressing the region's labor market demands. They're more than tripling the nursing and allied health programs enrollment capacity and more than doubling the size of its faculty. Uh, these buildings uh, exemplify how access to education and training can transform students and institutions and improve health care in the Bayou region. Uh, as board members know, it's also been a long time in the making, but Grambling's State Digital Library is finally open. Uh, Grambling State's Digital Library finally opened on August 22nd, and Commissioner Reed, along with Regents Aubrey, Cordell, and Williams Brown, traveled to Grambling, where thank you for you all being there for that ribbon cutting. Um, and for the grand opening of the digital library and the learning commons. It's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, it represents the very first digital library at any HBCU and the first of its kind in the state of Louisiana. Uh, it's going to be a cornerstone for educational advancement and technological innovation at Grambling, and it's a very, uh, we're very proud to have this asset in Louisiana's higher education system. Uh, sticking with North Louisiana, uh, back in June, Regent Pryor joined Commissioner Reed uh, and the North Louisiana delegation at the Shreveport Bossier Business Alliance's Higher Ed Summit. Um, it capped off with Commissioner Reed's three day uh, swing through North Louisiana, which included tours of the Shreveport Aerospace Technology Center and the Allied Health and Nursing Program at Susla. The Cyber Collaboratory and Student-Run Security Operations Center at LSU Shreveport and a tour of the Mansfield Female College Museum, which is the first women's institute of higher learning west of the Mississippi River. Uh, we are, I'm thrilled we have such an engaged board. Um, it's always great to see you all here, but even more thrilling to see when you're uh, attending and being representative of this board around the state uh, between our meetings. We're very grateful for your participation. Uh, staff has had a very busy summer as well. Um, this does not cover nearly everything they did. They did so much this summer. We appreciate the staff's hard work and their dedication to improving higher ed in the state. And this concludes my comments. Regents, at this time, we're going to ask Tristan uh, Denley to come forward. We'll have our momentum moment. Um, he's got a really impressive uh, co-requisite math numbers um, uh, to report on as well as to introduce us to our new mindset motivators, of course, spelled with an E-A-U-X. Uh, so Dr. Denley uh, and friends, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Is there any other spelling? That's what I'm saying. No, exactly right. Yeah, so what I want to do is just really quickly uh, just put this in a little bit of context. This has been unfolding really over the last five, six years in, uh, here in Louisiana and uh, really across the decade uh, across the nation. The, the reality is, and you all know it, that math and English is right at the very heart of any kind of learning really in K-12 or in higher ed as well. And so any kind of structural analysis of, uh, of, of, of curriculum just like this one is really going to establish that math and English are like the Kevin Bacon of curriculum. And so anything that we can do to improve the successful learning of math and English right at the very heart of people's curriculum is going to have not only a, an effect of enabling people to be do, better, do better in math and English, but all of the other subjects as well. And so that has really led to work across Louisiana to try to improve, improve math and English education, especially for those who come to our colleges and universities less well prepared than we or they would like. In the past, we used to do it like this, that we would enroll students into a remedial class, a standalone class that enabled them perhaps to build and strengthen the skills that they had from the past. And so I'm giving this illustration in math. Uh, of course, of those people, not everybody passes that class. Historically, only about 50% of them passed it. Uh, that's not the class they need to graduate, though. That's the class that would hopefully prepare them to take the class they needed to graduate. They needed to go on and take that class, and you can see that only a a fraction of those people who passed actually went on to take that second class. And then, of course, not everybody passed that one. Uh, only about half of them actually ended up passing that class. But when you chain all that together, you get a whopping 11%. That was where we were when we began this work, that students who began in standalone developmental education, one in 10 of them actually successfully made it through to take the math class that they needed to graduate. The other nine-tenths did not. Well, I don't, I don't need to persuade you we need to do something about that. Uh, we similarly needed to do something in English. In English, it's a little better. It was 12%. 12% 
And so what we did was to work uh, to scale an approach to math and English education called the co-requisite approach, which is where students are enrolled directly into the credit-bearing class that they need to graduate. But they are also simultaneously enrolled in what's called the co-requisite course, a support course that enables them to get, to get the support that they need to understand the challenging, uh, you know, the, the, the different challenging concepts or whatever it is, the skills that they need to master to be able to, uh, to, to successfully complete that course. What I'm happy to tell you is last fall, we scaled co-requisite math across all 28 institutions. Enormous big thank you to all of the hundreds of faculty who were involved in doing that work. And you can see right in front of you uh, the difference that that has made. Right there, 23, 24, that's the full academic year. We moved from that 11% to 52%. So an almost five-fold increase across the span of a year to, uh, to the success rates for those students in that crucial math class. Really quite remarkable. Uh, we are literally right now uh, fully scaling co-requisite English. And so this, for, this will be the first academic year where there is no standalone developmental English. Yeah, so it's worth sort of looking at the pattern. Of course, all the way along, small numbers of schools were using other kind of, kinds of techniques. Not everybody was only using that standalone remediation. And you can see a sort of a steady drip, drip, drip build of that. That finally moved to 52. Now this is statewide, everybody, all 28 institutions, everything about it. Yes, sir. Tristan, I'm just curious. This is amazing, right? I mean, the, the numbers speak for itself. So kudos to you all for the leadership on this. What would the objections be to this program that you hear? Like when you look at something that's this compelling in terms of the improvement, what do the naysayers say around why the old would work better? I'm just curious. Or does it exist anymore? Have you proven it out that no one says it? Well, I, I, I wish it were the case that we have proven it out. And, you know, I think some of you know that I've been involved in this work across several states. This is the third state where we've been able to, uh, where I've been able to be involved in scaling in this way. Um, it used to be the case that people said, well, that may work for your students, but I don't think it'll work for ours. That, I think that argument is, quickly evaporating. Um, it used to be the case that people said, well, it'll work for the students who are kind of towards the top end of the ACT spectrum. And you can see our results right in front of you, that you can see that the increases are for everyone. And so the data is really, I think, in remarkable ways speaking for itself. But change is change. And change at scale is change at scale. And it's, it's not always easy to do. And, it, you know, uh, and so I think in many ways, those are the barriers that the, the, the change is change, and scale at, scale, uh, change at scale is, is just not so easy to do. Yeah, yep. no, sure. So uh, the reality is we are, not, um, we are not sitting on our laurels at 52, uh, and neither are any of our faculty. The reality is we all want to be continuously increasing. Uh, one of the really important data points that we found along the way, and I'm sort of sharing it with it, you, you here, is to look at the students who were still unsuccessful. Right, the reality was we still didn't have um, you know, all of the students being successfully passing the class. What can we know about the ones who were still unsuccessful? What we see about the ones who were unsuccessful, it might be tempting to think that they were unsuccessful because they just really found math really hard or really found English really hard. What, what seems to be the case is something deeper is happening here. You can see almost 25% of those students who were unsuccessful last year they ended up with a cumulative GPA at the end of the year of 0.0. .0. They failed everything. It wasn't just that they found math challenging or English challenging. They found everything challenging. They, they were in college, but they never did figure out a way to get in college. Do you know what I mean? And so what we've seen now is that there, is, that there are methodologies to be able to engage with those students in different ways help them to think about themselves as learners in different ways and to motivate them in different ways so that they can approach their learning in a different way and then be just as successful as we would hope them to be. It's not that those students are just the ones who are the least well prepared. They are all across the preparation spectrum. We just need to engage with them in different ways. And so a, a massive big thank you to, uh, to the Gates Foundation and the 
Kresge Foundation and the Ascendian Foundation who supported uh, an initiative called Strong Start to Finish that has provided resources for us to be able to work with faculty across our state. This just this year, back in, in January, we had about 200 faculty who went through a professional development experience to be able to learn that new pedagogy, that new pedagogy of really trying to dig into helping students think differently about themselves as learners, motivate, using motivation science to be able to help them to really believe I can overcome the challenges that I've had in the past in this kind of material, to really understand the purpose of what it is that they're trying to learn, and also for them to feel like they can be part of that academic uh, uh, atmosphere that they are in. Of those 200, we were able to, to specifically choose 13 mindset motivators. These are the creme de la creme of, the, uh, of those who were involved in that professional development experience. An enormous uh, congratulations to them. We actually have uh, some of them who have been able to join us today. They're sitting right there, and you can see their name. <laughs> Right uh, there, they're, they're joined by my, my, my colleague, Chris Hullivan, who is the leader of the, the Motivate Lab team that have been doing all of this professional development. They are the nation's best uh, when it comes to understanding motivation science and how to provide that professional development to faculty. So you heard it all from me, but I really want you to hear it from the, the mouths of the people who really matter, the, the, the faculty. So I want to introduce Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Reynolds, who are representatives of our mindset motivators, and the, let them share a little bit. I just want to first of all thank all of you for this opportunity. Oh, okay. I just want to thank all of y'all for this opportunity to participate in the Mindset Motivators. Um, this is something that I have wanted to do. I've been a fan of Growth Mindset for a number of years. So having all of this amazing expertise and this wonderful group of cohort to work with has just been amazing. So I cannot wait to see how this impacts my students. So thank y'all. And I'll just add that I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for the support you've given CoREC uh, in general, and specifically these uh, momentum initiatives that I think are really innovative. I can tell you already since January, that first professional development we had, it has impacted our students at Northwestern State, and I'm excited about being a motivator and taking that idea to other campuses in my region um, and, and later when we get together uh, as, as a group. So thank you. Thank you for including me in this, Dr. Denley, and thank you, Regents, for your support. Yeah, thank you. So they will be going back to their campuses, and they are now faculty champions who will be working with their colleagues, leading faculty learning communities, leading workshops to really sort of spread these ideas, and certainly I will be happy to keep you abreast of exactly how that unfolds and the impact that it has on our students. So that's, that's our mindset, uh, or sorry, our mindset motivation momentum moment for <laughs> Uh, for August, so happy to take any questions you have. Sure. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's a great question. So literally, uh, and this, uh, this group was here yesterday and spent a whole day kind of workshopping that. So uh, it will, well, actually, why am I answering this question? You all should answer this question. I'd say what you're intending to do. Um, as someone who teaches the co-requisite math class, I started implementing their strategies last semester in the spring, and I can say, hands down, last semester's class was the best co-requisite math class I have ever taught. I had actively engaged students from day one. I was able to finish the training last semester before our first day of class, and so I was able to implement their strategies in my welcome email so that I set the stage from day one of what it was going to be like. That yes, math is a struggle, and that's okay. We're going to get through it together. And they joined me on that amazing journey, and I had one of the best success rates I have ever had as a math teacher. And I cannot wait to see that happen again this semester with my in-person correct. Um, so I'm just truly grateful to um, all of the people who have done the training for us, because the strategies they've given us are amazing. Or she said. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All through, welcome emails before you even set foot in the in in the door. 
happen all the way, all the way to the very end. Yeah. And I have to say, one of the things that was really impactful to me is that our words really have an impact on students. And so their training really taught me to kind of stop and think about what I was saying because I have been a part of higher education for a very long time. And so I know all of the ins and out of how higher education works, financial aid, registration, all of that. But very often we get into that we know the strategies, we know how to do everything, and we forget that these are incoming freshmen, these are first-time generation students. I work at a community college. We serve a different kind of student. We're not, they're necessarily, they're not first choice to come to. They come to us often because there's a reason they need to be with us. And so I really had to think about how I answer their questions and really making sure that not only did I really focus on math, because that's what I'm there for, but I focused on their entire college experience because if they have one bad encounter, that can be the straw that breaks the camel's back and they leave higher education. And that part of the training was really impactful to me, so I really make sure that I'm making those connections with students because yes, at the end of the day, I need to teach them math, but I want them to stay and I want them to be successful as college students. So that was really one of the biggest takeaways that I had. Uh, the 25 percent of the students that had the 0.0, .0 gpa is there any correlation that you're doing with the high school or asking them you know trying to find out what their high school experience was and trying to possibly if there was any anything that all went together that you could go back to the high school and prepare those children earlier because at 25 percent those are the ones that actually applied to college what about the ones that didn't you're exactly right yeah so this is this is really an ongoing research agenda that I mean I've been involved in now for the best part of a decade to really try to understand yes how do we impl implement this requisite approach but how do we continuously refine and move that 52 to 62 to 65 and, and so on so yeah absolutely we're we're looking for any ways that we can to try to understand what are the patterns and what are ways that we can prepare better uh, engage better support better all of those things absolutely I too want to congratulate you all. Thank you for the amazing work. Um, I had an opportunity to um, see the, the mindset uh, work uh, at the Momentum Summit and think about what it means when someone affirms your, your worth, when someone says to you, we're going to do this together and you can do it, uh, how powerful that is. And I, I thought about uh, one of the trainings that I saw where they were saying when students don't come to class, sending an email that says, I'm checking on you, Julie, and the class would have been so much better today if you had been there. And what that means for a student, that someone personally took the time to say that and affirm your value and worth. And so I do think it's important for us to do this research, have these phenomenal faculty who are gonna be on the campus, <coughs> spreading the news, doing this work, and reporting back what's working, what's working well, what's not working, so we can continue to learn and iterate on this together. So hats off to each and every one of you. I am really, really am grateful, excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you, Tristan, and, and everything you do for us year round. And this is impressive work. Next, we're going to vote on all of our committee reports um, and recommendations together. However, if any board member wants to take up any of these committee reports separately, just let me know, and we can certainly break them out and consider them individually. Mr. Chairman, I so move that we approve all the recommendations from the standing committees A, B, C, D, and E at one motion. So we're not separating anything out, right? That's correct. All right, I like that. We're going to do it in Second. Globo. I got a motion from uh, Regent Aubrey and Regent David is their second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed saying nay. Thanks, the motion passes. All right. Uh, next we have uh, the commissioner's report. I have to say that someone uh, who was here earlier today gave the commissioner the most incredible praise. He said there's only two other people I know as incredible as her and starts with a Michelle and a Kamala. So she's put in incredible, uh, an incredible effort and, 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 and um, I don't know how we 
I don't know how we're so lucky to keep you here is all I have to say, Kim. So Thank up to you, so Kim. Much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. You know, you know I love this work. So uh, happy to provide an update, speaking of things we love. So the first thing that we have continued to do every year, this is our very favorite service project, is to provide backpacks to send our kids, Louisiana's foster youth, to college on the right foot. Uh, and so we really are grateful to the staff that provided support, to Intergy Louisiana, thank you, thank you, and to Canvas, because we had 42 foster youth this year that were beginning college as incoming freshmen. So what we do every year, and Emily, shout out to Emily who um, led this effort, we put together backpacks for the students. They let us know if the student is gonna be on campus or not. So the on-campus students will get sheets and towels, et cetera. So the, the backpacks are customized. We bring them to the training for children and family services so the advisors can take them back to their respective communities. We don't know the students and we don't meet the students. So you see the secretary of DCFS, David Matlock there, and the uh, staff from DCFS that are picking up the backpacks uh, and take in the duffel bags and taking them back uh, to the students. So we've done over 100 foster youth we've sent to college with their materials and supplies, and I'm just so very proud of this team uh, for continuing to support students heading back to college. I think it's very important. Uh, next, um, in keeping with our work to align to the workforce and Regents leading the way, Regents was one of four public higher ed systems that was received a grant from the National Association of System Heads, uh, NASH. So these dollars are specifically to make sure our students have access to the best cyber resources and training, regardless of their field of study. So Dr. Denley is leading the Cyber Academy work, bringing together cyber faculty to curate great uh, learning materials for those students. And so this resource will help us to do that. Speaking of best in class, um, is the SHEO, oh, I'm sorry. So we had uh, our Aspen Institute um, Climate Action Report uh, was uh, launched in uh, DC in Baltimore. I had a chance to bring our governor's fellow uh, Vanessa with us uh, so we could talk about how higher education can lead in terms of green jobs and access for uh, students across uh, the country. Now, speaking of uh, amazing work, uh, the SHEO Policy Conference every year calls for proposals. There were 600 people at the conference this year. Um, everyone you see except me on the photo, submitted successfully a presentation that was selected through a competitive process to <coughs> present on Louisiana's work, uh, whether that was in uh, the FAFSA completion or short-term credentials or the funding formula or digital literacy or transfer. So shout out to the LOSFA team and the Regents team for having an opportunity to present and I had an opportunity to talk about workforce, higher education alignment as well. So very excited about that. And then finally, big shout out to uh, Governor Landry and of course, Regent Cardell for the press conference announcing Gumbo 2.0 as we try to erase the digital divide in Louisiana. $1.355 billion in funding for broadband access throughout our state. Uh, and so higher education, hospital, schools, law enforcement, homes, businesses will all benefit as these grants bring uh, high-speed internet connectivity into communities across Louisiana. And so we're very excited about that. And I want to echo Regent Solomon's comments about this fantastic board, because everywhere I go around the state, I'm greeted by a Regent member, and, or two, or three, or four, and it's fantastic that we collectively are walking the walk and talking the talk when it comes to advocating for higher education in our communities. So I'm just grateful. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll return it to you. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. Um, is there any other business to come before the board? And Doreen, no other public comments? All right, members, so appreciate you all. Um, we'll see you again next month on Tuesday, September 24th for our higher ed budget hearings and our board meeting on the 25th. Um, seeing that there's no public comments, I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn. Finley, 
Regent David, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, saying nay. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much. <laughs>